<laughs> What's up, fish tank people? Dustin's Fish Tanks bringing it to you on a Sunday, baby. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. Anybody remember the good old days of these cameras? In today's video, we're gonna talk about a fish that's an invasive species caused by the aquarium hobby. So in last Sunday's video, I talked about the red arowana and the Asian arowana. I loved your feedbacks on that. Well, in today's video, we're gonna be talking about one of the biggest established threats to our ecosystem here in the United States that was brought in from the aquarium hobby. I'm gonna talk about one fish and I'm gonna talk about one plant, both that I have firsthand knowledge with. Let me start with the combination of both fish and plants. And I said this at the end of last week's video, but a lot of you don't watch the end of the video, so I'm gonna say it right now. This was a comment on our Instagram page when I was talking about the Asian arowana being illegal in the United States, and someone lifted their head up from a bong and actually said this, bro, in Greenhouse 2.0, if you get an arowana, you could have an arowana growing marijuana. God help whatever California, Colorado, Washington State, Massachusetts, and now Canada has created. Okay, so with the fish plant combo aside, let me talk about an invasive species that is going on in my pond. Another pond video. Wait, I got a nice fish at the end of this video, I promise. But this is real deal. Note, I'm not gonna hide from the fact that I actually did introduce the plant I'm about to talk about into my in-laws pond out in no man's land, Kentucky. Note that is a closed body of water, but after what I'm seeing in this pond right here, I am feeling a little bit guilty about it. What I'm dealing with here today is water lettuce. Now this plant is currently working for me on three different fronts. So it's actually doing me some good before I talk about how invasive it is. Front one, it's providing a wonderful amount of shade for my baby koi. This pond was intentionally placed in full sun. Koi don't like it too hot, this helps that. Front two with the water lettuce. This plant is filtering the water like crazy. Again, anytime you can take a plant up out of the water, you are going to get way faster nitrogen absorption out of that plant. Why? Because the plant has more readily available, as much as it can handle CO2 and more sunlight because it's up out of the water. For every inch you go down in the water, you exponentially lose light. And reason number three is predators. Now, as many of you know, I've had problems with both herons, raccoons in the past here, but now we have a new pest rolling around these days, the hawk. Look, I love birds, I love nature, but these hawks are no joke. It's not just one hawk, too, it's four hawks, and they actually live over in my neighbor's yard. I was walking over to get my girls the other day, and one of them greeted me, it was about this tall, and it was low in a tree, and it signaled to the other hawk nearby, yo, here comes bro, get out of the way, and then two of them flew off, okay? They're wicked cool, in my opinion, until they decide to savagely come in and take out some of my koi, okay? So I've kept the water lettuce for a reason. However, with these three fronts working for me the other day, I did finally decide to hop in here and pull out some of these suckers. Why? Well, for starters, I wanted to see my fish for the first time, and I wanted to get my lilies grown. There's more to life than water lettuce. My guess was that I would probably pull out about 50, maybe 100 plants. Let me remind you all, I started with five, five water lettuce in this pond. You can see what it has done to my pond in a short amount of time. Imagine what it would do to a waterway in your area. This plant could easily choke out all the surface plants around like it did my lilies or any of the below water aquatic plants that are helping the native species. I would love to get your comments on this. Maybe you've seen a plant that's choked out a waterway. Maybe you live in California where I believe the water lettuce is a problem. Maybe there's some other plant that's growing rampantly. Nothing you can do. Talk about kudzu down in Tennessee. It's a big problem. So drop me a comment on a plant that you've seen grow wild and evasive. Now we've talked about the plants. I wanna talk more about a fish that is clearly the result of humans bringing it in with the aquarium hobby. This is a problem, this is your problem, this is our problem. We have to work on this problem together. Here's the rub. But now I wanna talk about snakeheads. Now look, I talked about snakeheads in another invasive fish video, but I had a chance to talk with my man Dave down at Seagrest Farms about the, sea, about the snakehead, so I feel it's worth talking about again. Just to recap on Dave, 
Dave is actually the head of importing at Seagrass Farms. If you're not familiar with who Seagrass is, where have you been? They bring in a million fish a week, okay? And Dave's job, who by the way, he quit a good job in sales to go and be the head of importing to bring in cool species and expand the hobby. So this is a fish of super interest to him. I asked him when we were talking about the red arowana being illegal in the United States, Dave, what other species do you have or are a part of this problem that are not being allowed to be brought into the U.S.? And if you want to see some of what Dave brings in, check out the links around here and click the links around here to check out his massive 22 box uh, unboxing from the Czech Republic, which includes long fin neon, some really insane apistos, and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, bottom line, Dave is the man. He's a great person to talk to about this. All right, now during my conversation with Dave about the red arowana, I asked him what other species they have sort of issues with when it comes to bringing them into the United States. A lot of them are illegal. The second species that he brought up was the snakehead or the chana species, okay? Now look folks, I'm gonna need your help in the comments because I do not keep snakeheads and I'm not familiar with a lot of the dwarf varieties. Now here's the rub. United States Fish and Wildlife has put a blanket ban on the entire genus of chana. This unfortunately includes a lot of dwarf snakehead species that are more than suitable for the aquarium both with their small size, some of them only getting about 25 centimeters, and their calmer demeanor. Those species are as follows. The Chana Blairi, presumably named after my man Heiko, who I'm boys with, who's a legendary aquarium fish collector. The Chana Cachoa, no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. The Chana Orientalis, and the Chana Andrio. Please help me if I'm pronouncing those wrong. But these are smaller snakehead species, not allowed in the US, but that stay small and could be good in your aquarium. But unfortunately, they're banned in the United States. But why the blanket ban? Straight up, folks, this was caused by people releasing them into and upon from an aquarium, okay? The blanket ban on all snakeheads coming into the US is because there's a 60 mile radius in the Potomac that the northern snakehead is firmly established. It's in there, it's growing there, it's breeding there, it's living there, and probably it ain't going away. I'm gonna read this directly off of the Maryland Fish and Wildlife site. Snakeheads are a freshwater fish, but few may tolerate low salinity waters. Snakeheads can resemble the native bowfin and have well-toothed jaws, platelets, and breathe atmospheric air through the use of a simple labyrinth organ. This makes them extra hardy, okay? Their ability to breathe air allows snakeheads to survive in habitats in low dissolved oxygen. They can also survive out of the water for several days if their skin remains moist. The northern snakehead, China Argus, is native to the Yangtze River in the China Basin. It reaches over 33 inches in length, folks. It's fish about that long. It can tolerate a wide range of temperatures from 32 degrees up to 85. This fish, fish prefers stagnant, shallow ponds, swamps, and slow-moving streams, uh, and lives in mud, substrate, and aquatic vegetation. Female snakeheads average around 40,000 eggs, but can release up to 100,000 eggs, and can spawn multiple times a year. You can see that this is a problem. Newly hatched larvae are protected by both by one or both parents until they reach the juvenile stage. Sexual maturity is reached within two years when the total body length of this fish is around 12 inches. Here's the environmental concern. The northern snakehead is described as a voracious predator, fish, and freshwater crustaceans and amphibians. Its native range from 24 to 35 degrees north and temperature tolerance between 32 and 85 indicates that if introduced the northern snakehead population could become established throughout the United States and possibly adjoining Canadian provinces. Because of their feeding style, they could outcompete popular sport fish such as the largemouth bass. Biologists are also concerned they could introduce parasite diseases that could harm other native species. It goes on to talk about the 2002 reproduction of northern snakeheads in a small lake in Croft, Maryland. They were subsequently extinct from that. They went in there and killed them all. While they were able to kill all the snakeheads in that small pond, they unfortunately, since 2004, have been established in the Potomac River. There's over 60 miles of river in the Potomac. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services continue to conduct research to assess the impacts and ecosystem and efforts of the snakehead. Research conducted in the Potomac River includes electronic fishing. It goes on and on and on to talk about how big of a problem this fish is and what they're doing about it in the Potomac River. But the bottom line is this. 
This was a fish brought in by the aquarium hobby and then has actually taken over a 60 mile radius of the Potomac and could spread further. You can also see the map here of where snakeheads have been found. All right, so I know what you might be saying to yourself. You're saying, well, why? that's fine, Dustin. Why do they have such a blanket ban on the entire genus when it's only one species and it's one running rampant in the Potomac River? Here's the rub, and here's the part that I think people do not understand when it comes to bringing both fish and plants into the United States, okay? There is a ridiculous amount of species I personally have to deal with the plant Bible to bring in certain species, and I've had to pay to have plants destroyed that are not allowed in the United States, okay? So put yourself in the position of the United States Fish and Wildlife. They've got, on a Monday, they've got 40 boxes coming in. You're an employee. Someone has some sort of a China species. You gotta look this species up, then you gotta go to some Bible. You get it, you read it, it's, oh, it's China, whatever. You look it up, you've got some tiny little picture in here. Now, you've got some bag that's full of fish poop, it's cloudy, and you've got some fish that looks like a snakehead in there, and you have to determine whether this fish is allowed into the country because it's X, Y, and Z fish, or is this the northern snakehead that's not allowed. It's an extremely hard job that I think people overlook, not to mention this person is on a time crunch because they've got 40 other boxes behind them. So they're looking in this cloudy little bag trying to figure out, is this the dwarf species, is this the northern species? I've seen them do it with plants, I've seen them do it with fish. It's not a fun thing, and in fact, I am with the USDA's entire genus ban on all China species because of the fact it's simply too hard to, to decipher between the two. You don't know when you're looking at a bag whether you got one that's gonna get to 33 inches long or one that's gonna stay 25 centimeters. Human error happens, it's already happened, and it happens all the time. Quite frankly, I've been out to California and seen Ari Pimas available for sale in the pet store, which I believe is a size one illegal fish to bring into the United States. In conclusion, I like the blanket banning of all China and snakehead species into the United States. Are we missing out on a couple of cool small dwarf uh, snakehead species? Probably, but overall for the benefit of the entire ecosystem around where the larger ones can actually survive and live out of water for a while, I think it's a good move. But maybe I've got this all wrong. Maybe there's some sort of workaround that you've thought of. Maybe there's some way they could bring the dwarfs in but not the large ones in and get rid of the blanket. Maybe you've caught a snakehead in the Maryland or the Potomac River. In conclusion, if you catch a snakehead in the Potomac River, do me and the ecosystem a favor and kill it. Everybody hit the like button, subscribe button, and share button, and drop me a comment on what you think about the blanket ban on snakeheads or this mass of water lettuce. Tank on, everybody. Later. Can I have a second there, Mr. Cicada? Can I get this video done?